I got my stimulus credit card this week. It took me a couple days to figure out how to get the money off of it and into a checking account because I was like, I don't I don't like gift cards. I love them as long as I don't keep them long because the longer I hold on to them, the greater the chance I have of losing them. So I was like, yeah, thank you for the credit card government stimulus and let's get it off. So my question is, am I supposed to tithe on that? Yeah, why not? How much? I mean, it's just an extra. I mean, it's not like I worked for it or did I? Was it income, or is it? Like, do you tithe on Christmas gifts that you get at Christmas? Like your mom gives you a hundred bucks, and you're like, "Mom, I'm 50. I mean, thanks, but uh, I mean, do I tithe on that?" You wouldn't do your mom's. <laughs> is anyone? Uh, uh, it's kind of a rhetorical question, but I kind of want to know: Is anyone tithing on their stimulus check? Like, is that even something you thought about? How's that? We'll just say, did you think about it? Whether or not you're doing it, you did, two people, anyone else? You thought about it, at least. It entered your mind. Am I supposed to tithe on a stimulus check? Mine was 3600 because I've got, you know, six kids in my family, so it's 600 each. And I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? I don't, I've never played the lottery, so I, I've never thought of that. <laughs> See, Dave Ramsey calls the lottery a tax on poor people. And so I've never done that. It's a great question. I mean, ideally, I would love to uh, piously say yes. Well, of course, I'm so spiritual. <laughs> but doesn't that say it's 10% of your increase? So if it's your increase... Increase or income. See, that's where I've always made a distinction. It's income means I work for it. Increase is it just... See, that would be different to me. If, if, if my bank account increased, that's... Oh, I got a tithe, but if it was my income, because the stimulus is not my income, it's just an increase. So I needed to. All right, how's this? Is it a struggle to tithe? No. <laughs> I did not expect anyone to be bold and say that. No. No. <laughs> fantastic question. I think it's more of a statement. Well, I think that's where we're headed today, actually. So we are in the third week in the first part of James chapter 5, and the desire that James has right here is to stir up in us just to consider how it is that we're spending our resources, the, the things that we have in our lives. And we have a lot of resources to spend, says James. And he, James focuses on money. But there are other things that we have, because he's appealing uh, to eternity in light of eternity in the first six verses. And he, he uses these undeniable truths to force us to reflect first on death and then second on judgment that follows after that. And he starts in James chapter 5, verse 1. He says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted. And here's where the nightmarish quality that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks comes into play. And their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasures. Beyond being a rich person, the nightmare speaks to anyone, whether it's man or woman, rich or poor, who has fully embraced fully invested into things of the earth, trying to get stuff from the earth as a source for our life, for our joy, for our peace, and for a man or woman who is rich or poor, who is fully invested down here one day in a nightmarish quality, James is saying, in death, 
we will finally be awakened to the reality that everything that we have invested in down here has rotted and rusted and been moth-eaten. And what James is wanting to do at the beginning of chapter 5 is to wake us up before we eternally go to sleep, where we will eternally then wake up and be aware of what really matters in this world and what does not matter in this world. James is saying, I want you to figure this out now before you die. Figure out what is really important. And then he goes on in verse 4. He says, Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived luxuriously a life of wanton pleasure, and you have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. The problem that James is confronting, it's not just money, it's not just having possessions, it's the spirit that desires and it does not give, that that consumes, it's going to hoard, it's always bringing things into him or herself with no thought that maybe the resources, whether that be money or time or our talents or our abilities, that maybe they could be used to benefit others, that, that, that the things that we have might be better put to play another way where it doesn't even dawn on them of that possibility. It's not just that you have resources. That is not a bad thing. It's that you stored them up. It's, that you acqu- it's, it, it's not that you acquired wealth. That is not a bad thing. It's that you withheld things that you should have been putting into play. You are, that you had an opportunity to invest the resources of your life to things that you have to be able to make an eternal difference. But your primary commitment had been to the earth, to the stuff of earth, and it was to live luxuriously. Verse 5, it was to live luxuriously, and what that meant was to live softly. And the picture is where you're spending your life stuffing a pillow with all of the things that you want so that you can live softly. And there are people in this world who consume in order to live, and you know this, that, and and you consume. We have to consume if we want to live. I mean, that's just a reality. We consume. If you don't, you die. And there are others in this world that they live to consume, where their passion or pattern or addiction is to consume. Living to consume is their preoccupation, and it becomes an insatiable appetite. It's never enough. I've always got to have more. And, and I need to bring more and more and more into myself. And all of my energy and all of my life is spent trying to pull it in, trying to bring it in and fill something that feels like it's missing inside of me. So as I think about this reality, because this is what James is talking about, for many of us, because, because when I find myself in this very death dealing cycle what dawns on me is that quite often i get involved in i get involved in this without even knowing that i'm doing it it becomes a pattern for me and i don't even know that i'm aware when it happens i don't even know if that happens to you we are accountable for our choices that we make for the things that we get caught up in and for many of us, we, we start to live life just kind of a blur, where you have the stress of your family, you have the stress of marriage, your children, your parents, or school, or, or your friends, or your career, or things that are coming in and attacking you, or you, you just get sick, or something is happening, and it feels like all I can do right now is focus on today, and I can barely even do that. I mean, to have a big picture, I mean, that's fantastic. If I ever had that luxury, I just need, I just, I, if I can just even keep my head down and get through so much of today. So many of us, we start to, that, we find that to be our pattern. Where we're always, then maybe, maybe because of all these stresses and all the, the, the hurts, what I really need, what I really want, if I could just find a way to release some of that stress, just a little of it, just today, if I could just find a, a way to release that pressure. So I'm starting to look for something to relieve some of that pressure in my life. And in our culture, there's a lot of ways that we have found that we love to tell people, this will relieve your pressure. If you just go down this way, just for five minutes, just for a half hour, if you just buy this, if you just do that, you can relieve the pressure. You will feel better yesterday. You can have it now. Just sign up here. No money down. Free shipping. 
it will feel so much better, and it gives, you, it gives me a sense of hope, free shipping. It's going to be here in two days. It's going to make my, for whatever reason, I can relax a little bit more. I don't even know what I bought, but it'll be here in two days. It might even be here tomorrow. And then I get caught up and I find myself in bondage because I rarely stop to think. I rarely stop to think, how do I proactively, before I spent all of my time, my money, and my talent, before I do any of that, think about where intentionally, where do I want to have spent my time and spend my money? And where do I want to spend the gifts that God has given me? I mean, have I ever, have I ever just pulled back and thought, where would I like to have that go? if I could have even that choice. Because I don't want to be at the end of my life and start wondering, where did that money go? Oh my gosh, I had so much. you got to be kidding me. I have no idea where it went. Where did my time go? Oh my goodness, I had no idea. I I don't even know. Even our talent, you know, the juice of our life is what I like to think of it as. Just kind of the juice, the energy, the, the stuff I have inside of me. By the end of our life, we might look around and look back and realize that, that I spent the juice of my life, the, the productive years of my life, I spent it on something that I don't even think even matters in, at all. It, it's not that important now that I look back on it. I'm like, how did I ever think that was so important? Because I look back, I'm like, That's, it, it wasn't. And we did it because, well, at the time, I didn't stop to think. I didn't stop to wonder while I was in the middle of it. But there is one thing that seems to have universal power to stop us and make us think. The thought of death. And James knew that, which is why he gives us this nightmare. Jesus knew it also, which is why he talked about in Luke chapter 12 about a man whose land was so productive, it created a very big problem for him. Well, what do I do with the resources that I've acquired because I've got so much? Well, that's a really good question, and and it's a question a lot of us don't even ask. What do I do with my talent? What do I do with my time? I've got a lot of it. What do I do with the degree that I have from college? Where am I going to spend this? If I could think about it and ask that question, where do I want to spend it? Starting in verse 16, so Jesus told them this story. A rich man's farm produced a big crop. And he said to himself, myself? (laughs) What can I do? I don't have a place large enough to store everything. Later he said, ah, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build a bigger one where I can store all my grain and other goods. And then I'll say to myself, self, (laughs) you have done really well. You have stored up enough good things to last for years to come. Live it up. Eat, drink, be merry, and enjoy yourself. The problem for that individual in Luke chapter 12 is that he did what most of us do or or live the way that most of us live. And I'm not pointing any fingers in this room. It's just kind of in our, we'll just say our culture, is that it did not occur to him that maybe he could have used the resources that he had on something other than himself. The only option that occurred to him, because nobody ever cast a vision, no one ever said, it can be different for you if you just think about it, maybe it didn't occur to him that maybe he had other options other than to build that big barn. So he ended up doing what what everyone does. He went with the flow, he tore down his barn, built a bigger barn so that he could store more stuff in that bigger barn. Now, as I think about this guy who lives this way and does this stuff, what occurs to me is that he is not what I I would put in the profile. He's not this classically (laughs) evil man, you know? He's not some villain, evil. This is not the man that we would paint as that. He's not going around abusing, violating, hurting anyone. And in fact, the parable of, that Jesus gives here, and he's not even calling him evil. He's not like, ah, you're a bad man. Uh, but verse 20, but God said to him, you fool. Jesus calls him foolish. Whether he is evil or foolish, the consequences are actually going to be the same. You fool, says God, tonight you will die. Consequences is going to still happen. The same thing is going to happen. You're still going to die. And Jesus asks, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but to lose his soul? He's saying the exact same thing that James is saying, or James is saying the same thing that Jesus is saying. You need to wake up to the fact 
that life is just a vapor. It is short. And there is an end for all of us. And if you have invested your time, your, your giftedness, the juice of your life, the treasure, the money that you have, if you have invested all of that in something that is just a vapor, whether <laughs> you need to be aware of that. And whether you love God or not, whether you are a follower of Jesus or not, committed, passionate about loving Jesus, I promise you when we die, we will wake up to the fact that we did waste some of the resources of our life, and we will weep and howl, and you will mourn at your decisions, especially if you were spending all the juice of your life on earth facing towards the stuff of earth, even if you love Jesus, you will weep and then howl at your decisions. And as we talked about this, last few weeks, what it stirred up in me was this issue of how we spend the resources of our lives is not, you know, this is not just some pet peeve that James is on. He's not uh, just, uh, I'm against those rich people, you know, and I uh, bring them all down, crab pulling each other back into the hot water. If I'm boiling, you're boiling with me. He's not just, this is not just what he's after. What he's saying is this is also very central to the gospel that we preach. This is essential. It is this, one of the central messages and missions of Jesus Christ himself who spoke two things more than anything else in his earthly ministry. He spoke of the eternal value and destiny of the human soul, and he spoke about money over and over and over again. How we earn it, how we spend it, how we invest it, how we hoard it, how we give it, and ultimately what it is that we do with that particular resource. And how the way we use that resource reveals, it's going to reveal things that are going on inside of our heart. It's going to reveal what it is that we really care about. It's going to reveal what it is that we love by how we use that resource, a resource that God has given us. Matthew 25, Jesus gives what is known as the parable of the talents. And in that particular parable, he demonstrates exactly what James is saying about how we need to spend the resource that we have. It says in verse 14, for it's not for it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his own ability. And their ability is simply in this, you know, it's, it's, it's coins, it's money. One person given five talents, another is given two, another uh, third is given only one. According to their ability to manage that resource, Two of the slaves, what they immediately did is they put those resources into play. They started to invest them. It says, and he went on his journey, verse 16, the one who had received the five talents immediately went and did business with them and earned five more talents. In the same way, the one who had received the two talents earned two more. And as the two people put the resources into play, the things that the master had given them put that into play when they were released them. What it is is we're getting a picture of the kingdom of God where we start to actually reap the things we didn't actually sow because they don't really, they're not sowing. The, what they got was a gift from God. They put it into play. They did not really have any part in this other than releasing it and investing what it is that God had given them. Some of us think that we have very little to offer in this world. Just, I think when I was like, you know, 18, I, I was thinking I was the greatest man alive. I had so much to offer this world. The older I get, the less I go, ah, really? <laughs> I don't have as much as I thought. And, and I don't know, it's not self deprecation, it's a realization that what I have is from God. And our master is the one who gives us talents, and he gives me abilities and talents. I did nothing to earn them. In the kingdom field that we are laboring in and that we are serving in in this world, very little of what we have to invest is even going to cause tremendous growth. It's not going to suddenly, I invest this and 10,000 people come to Christ. You know, that's, that's not going to, it's not going to be explosive. That is the way it is. And, and that doesn't bother me. I'm okay with that. But these guys are the, uh, in the master's field. They doubled their return. And that's a pretty fantastic return rate. Verse 20, the one who had received the five talents came up and brought, uh, brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted me five talents to me. See, I have earned you five more. Also, the one who received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted me two talents. See, I, I've earned you two more talents. What they put into play, it did multiply, and now they have more to give. But the guy who had one talent, he knew about giving it away. 
he knew about investing, how things multiplied, especially in the kingdom endeavor, but he was more afraid, verse 18. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. And I wonder, I'm like, is that really a bad thing? Uh, I don't think that's a bad thing because I'd really hate to have invested it and lost it because then I might, my head might roll. Um, I mean, is it really a, a bad thing? Because is it an evil thing? Uh, and because I think an evil thing would have been, oh, I'm going to go take it and I'm going to spend it on myself. <laughs> We're going we're gonna to go do something. We're going to go do some shopping. I think that would have been more of an evil thing. And, and it starts to make me a bit nervous when Jesus responds to him because I think he's not doing anything bad. Maybe, maybe he should just you know, go and talk to Jesus. Jesus, I don't get it. You seem to be a little angry about this guy, but I don't know that he did really anything wrong. Can't you just relax? Because this guy's afraid to put it into play. Can't we just talk more about his fear and how to help him and walk him through this? He hid it in the... The ground, he didn't, he didn't do anything really wrong, Jesus. He didn't spend it or waste it. But it says, you worthless, lazy slave, did you know that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I do not scatter? Throw this worthless slave out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I'm like, ow! That seems a little overreactive. So what's the point? It drives home again how we spend the resources of our lives is not a small issue at all. It's not the side dish on the table. It's not some quirky little rabbit trail that James ran down on. This is central to the message and mission of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 8 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he is rich, yet for our sake, he didn't store up his wealth, he didn't hoard it. He, 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 the pattern that he demonstrated from the beginning, the model that he gave for our sake, he became poor so that through his poverty, you and I might become rich. And then having been made rich, he then calls us. You are now called to follow that same pattern. You will get filled up. You give out of what God has given you. You put the things that you have into play, the things that God gives you, and when you do that, God gives you more to give. Oh. And the pattern is so fundamental hmm, that if you can't understand that, you may not understand the gospel. That's one of the hard things because this is the heart of God. It's, it's why when we give and when we give extravagantly, it, you start to feel joy because what it is is you're starting to connect to the very God, to the core of who God is. When you give, it connects you to the very heart of God. Even if you don't know it's God that you're connecting to, even if you don't have a personal relationship with God, when you give out of your resources, you become in sync with a redemptive flow through history. And when we do this, there is a battle that actually happens. There is a clash of swords where the sparks of the metal are flying off when you give. There is a spiritual force in the world that is fighting. And even uh, from, from us ever putting the resources of our lives into play, and that force that works actively, it is actively stopping us and trying to stop us from living with freedom with our time and our money and our abilities, trying to stop us from putting them into play. And it has a name, and it's mentioned four times in the New Testament, all by Jesus. Matthew 6, Luke 16, where Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Jesus is identifying a rival God right here, small g. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, which is, or wealth. Oftentimes you'll just see that as wealth, but it's mammon. Before, more than money, because this is more than a wealth issue, more than money. Mammon is a principality. It is a spiritual resource behind money. Money by itself is a resource. It is a tool. It is not evil. And in the hands of people who, can, who, who, who love God and are, are wanting to use it as a, tiff, a, a gift and, and bless it, and use, or people who want to use it proactively, it is a resource that is good. It is beneficial to be used. Where we think, you know, how do I want to put this resource into play? What if I use it over there? What if I take this money that I have, this resource, time, talent, ability, and I use it over here? That is a proactive stance, and it's a very good thing. 
It is something to be used, something God can use in incredible ways to further his kingdom, his kingdom work. But the problem for many, rather than being a resource, it starts to become a source. Rather than deciding, how do I invest the gifts and resources that I have? Mammon gets involved, and rather than releasing this thing, it starts to hold on to me, and I, I need to acquire more and more and more, and I'm never satisfied with the things that I have. And the purpose of mammon, not money, there is a difference, it is the spiritual power behind money. It is to pull us down, put us in bondage, and to not give us lasting joy. And we've all heard the cliche, do you own your possessions or do your possessions own you? The purpose of mammon is to make sure that your possessions are things that you don't actually really enjoy. That your possessions are things that possess you. That they're never enough that it gives you joy for a, or, or happiness or something for a second, but then I need to acquire more. I need to get more because that one thing didn't meet my need, so now maybe the next one will meet my need, but that doesn't meet my need, so now I'm going to go to the next one and the next one, and we continue on in that pattern of, yeah, maybe the next thing will do it, and it starts to, and, and again, hear this. There is absolutely nothing wrong with possessions. I am not again, I am not saying anything derogatory unless what you have to have when you finally get, and now that you have, it starts to consume all your time, your money, your talents, and you're in bondage. And I wish this wasn't a principle I had to. <sighs> I wish it was a principle I. I wish I really had to dig deep to really look at myself and find that. Well, maybe if I just really imagine, I, maybe if I use my imagination, I'll understand this. I wish, <laughs> but I don't have to use my imagination because I have been pulled down, down by this many times and I am very aware of this. Have you ever been brought down by something that, that uh, for some reason, you just had to have it? I just have to have that thing. And you figured it out. Figured out how I was going to get it, too. I, and, and then I convinced my wife, maybe you convinced the spouse, oh, if we, if we just get that. And, and why shouldn't we get it? And, and how can we get it? And, and we're going to enjoy it so much when we get it. But soon after you got it, you didn't enjoy it as much as you thought, and then you went on to the next thing. You didn't use it like you thought. It's like my kids a week after Christmas. They're already bored with their toys, and they're dreaming of what they're going to get for their birthday, and they start their birthday list, or they're begging to find ways to make money so they can go shopping because they're already tired of all their things that they just got. But I'm no different than them. And instead of joy being given, the joy is sucked out of you. This thing that is supposed to be fun, it isn't fun. And for some of us, it, it could be your career where it, I thought I was going to meet my needs and it's just really it's sucking the life out of me. And, and I never stopped to think, how do I want to spend the juice of my life? Well, I just had to have this cabin, or I, and we, if we just get that boat, if I just have this camper, and, and there's nothing wrong with any of those things, the, the boat, the cabin, the camper, uh, whatever it is, they're fantastic. You can have, I hope you do have a boat, cabin, and camper. I hope you have all three of them, and more. I hope, I, I don't, uh, that's not the issue. I hope God gave it to you. I hope it's a gift that you use to serve your family, and I know many people who have cabins, boats, and, and campers, and it serves their family, it serves their friends, serves the kingdom. Good thing, great thing. I don't have those things, but I'm glad others do. How many more people, though, bought those things and have it because they needed it, whether for the right image, the right status, it was the next barn that they were building, they thought it would meet some need in their lives, but they never got the joy out of it, started to take all their time, resources, money, and it never met that need. It owned them, and it started to devour them. And there's nothing wrong with having the, the cabin, the boat, the camper, or a nice house, or a, a nice vehicle, whatever it is. They can be gifts that serve you. They can be a blessing from God. And I don't get rid of them unless what you're purchased isn't, ser if I'm serving it or is it serving me? 
And what if I don't own it? What if it owns me? Well, I, I might need to take a kingdom look at that thing. One of the resources, one of the responses to this, when we start to think of this as, well, maybe I'm supposed to sell this house camper or, or a car, and, and, and maybe you should. Maybe, maybe you need to sell them. Maybe, maybe you shouldn't. So how do I know? How do I know? Do I or do I not do it? How do, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. But if I have something that, that, well, you and I have something that kids don't have. We have, we have maturity and wisdom. And James says, if anyone lacks wisdom, if you don't have it, you ask. He's been telling us that. Go ask God for wisdom who gives generously. Husbands and wives and single people where we come to God and we say, God, we've already spent the time of, and our resources and our money on things that we, we didn't really think about before we spent them. But now we're, we're going to stop for just a minute and wonder about where it is that we spend the resources of our lives and remind us, God, God, remind us, rekindle our hearts relative to the things that what we really care about. Remind us of what we really care about, God, so that on the day I don't wake up face to face with God and not be judged or damned but really sad that I wasted so many of my resources. And the thing is, there's no cookie-cutter answer here for what you're supposed to do, for what I'm supposed to do. Because we could get really legalistic and judgmental about this issue. We, we could, you know, it sprouts up all over the place where we start looking at each other. How did you get that car? I mean, really, is that a, I mean, that was a really, that, that's a $40,000 car. Where'd you get that money? What, how are you wasting, uh, that's not how I would have spent my resources. Why? It's because I love God and I'm investing in his kingdom. But are you? Because that seems like a really waste of your money. Are you really doing that? I mean, can you really afford that? I mean, I see the house that you bought. I mean, I see that you're going on a vacation with your entire family to Disneyland for a week? Oh my goodness, you're staying at that hotel? How do you waste the resource of your life? How did you afford to travel there? How did you get this? How did you do that? We can do that easily. We can look around and see that problem. The culture of James that he was speaking to, when this was written, is a culture that believed if you have wealth, it is a sign that God loves you. God's blessing uh, that, that, that the more stuff you have, well, you must be doing it right. God's blessing you. You must be spiritual. You must be uh, really connecting to God. You must be obeying God. And in that system, now I feel like I need to buy more so that I look right. Because I really want people to think I love God. Because I really do love God, but I don't know that people see that I love God. So I'm going to start spending. In fact, I don't have the money, so I'm going to go get a loan. Because if I can buy the right things, then people may think that I'm spiritual, that I love God. Because I really do love God. But why, God, why don't you love me? I don't think God loves me because he's not giving me the blessings of wealth. I don't have the right house. I don't have the right this. I don't have the good cart. Ah, I want the cart with spoilers on it. Ah, I just... I don't have, I don't have. So how do I figure out how to acquire? I don't have, I must not be doing it enough. God, you must not love me. God, I don't know how to do it. I'm trying to do everything I can, but no one ever don't look right. So I need to spend things I don't have so I look right. And then maybe, maybe if I even look right, then God, you'll love me. And I'm spinning out in my head and I'm freaking out. God's not happy with me or he would bless me. And if you buy into this belief, then your performance and all of your energy, your time, your money, your resources are going to be spent to prove how spiritual you are and loved by God you are. But then we got to flip this whole thing around because that's not the culture we live in. If we were to live in James's chapter 5 and we start to get legalistic about it, you develop another new culture about this. Rather than your big house being a sign of how spiritual you are and how much God loves you, we now see it as how unspiritual you are. It means, well, you must be disobeying. You must be sinning and that, that, that your priorities are all wrong. It's a sign that you're worldly. You're obviously hoarding it for yourself. The real sign of spirituality is that now you live in a ratty old house and a rusty old car. And, and maybe you should, you know, live in that rusty car. Maybe that's what you should be doing if you really want to love Jesus and using the resources God's given you, you should live in that rusty two-door car. And if you do live in the old house and the rusty old car, it could be that you just don't know how to take care of your house or your car. I mean, that could be it. It could also be that you live in that house and have that car because you really do have a desire 
to keep the resources of your life free so that you can empower and release and invest in God's kingdom. And maybe you could actually afford more and have more, but you are investing in the work of the kingdom of God in ways that you couldn't do any other way other than if you lived in that house or in that car. So do you know what the deal is here? The deal is I don't know. I mean, I can't, I, I can't tell. I don't, I don't know how to, I don't know. We can't use this, what James is saying, we can't use this as a judgment over other people. I can't look at you and you can't look at me and discern where our heart is and where our relationship with God is. Well, he's got this cabin. They don't even use it. Uh, they have the second house. They have a boat, an RV. Uh, they've got the jet ski. They, got, they must be hoarding things. Uh, we don't know that. We don't have any idea. The critical question that all of us need to be asking is not, why do I or do not, uh, what do I own or do, do I own or what am I allowed to own? The critical question is, here is the question. Are the resources of my life, whether it's my time, my finances, or my abilities and my talents, are they freed up enough so that I can put them into play for the kingdom of God? Is my life arranged in such a way that that's even possible? The purpose of mammon is to do everything it can in the spiritual realm to make sure that you don't even ask that question. That is what mammon's goal is. I don't even want you to ask that. It wants to pull you down into earth and bind you to the earth so much that you never have the freedom to even release your resources. That is the job of mammon. Richard Foster in his book, by the way, if you have not read any Richard Foster Read anything you can get your hands on. I mean, it's like eating jerky, though. i got to warn you. You're going to chew, and it is meaty, and it's tough, and it is so good, especially if it's peppered, like peppered Foster. Man, that's good. It, 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 Richard Foster, great. Anyhow, in his book, Sex, Money, and Power, he says, when Jesus declares you cannot serve God and mammon, he is personifying mammon as a, a rival god in saying this, Jesus is making it unmistakably clear that money is not some impersonal medium of exchange. Mammon is a power that seeks to dominate us. Milton, in his book, Paradise Lost, he talked about mammon as a spiritual power when he said, he said, in this way, mammon was thought he was in heaven. It was even thought, even before the fall, he was the least upright of the spirits because whenever mammon was in the presence of God before, before the demonic hordes following Satan and the rebellion against God, before that, when he was up in heaven, one of the angels, even then, Mammonas, he studied the golden streets more than he ever looked at the most precious. He was studying the precious things below him rather than the precious one in front of him. The purpose of mammon is to bend you over to the things of earth. All of this ties into what James has been teaching us literally for months and months, beginning in chapter 3, verse 13, when he said, Who is wise and, and understanding among you? James then went on to talk about two kinds of wisdom, where men and women were standing up straight into the life of God that only he can provide. Those who are in humble submission to God, drawing life and wisdom from God, vertical living, standing straight into the life and presence of God. Into God who can provide what cannot be provided in the things around us. And there's nothing wrong with money. Money can be used. Money is a resource. It can be used for God. And, and, and when wise men and women put it into play, but it can also be a bondage. The purpose of mammon is to bind you to the earth. And then James goes on in chapter 4, where he continues with the same imagery that he'd been giving, this bent over or this standing up straight image. He uses this physical posture over and over throughout the book of James, where he started talking about spiritual adultery. 
He started to say, talk about a bentness to the earth as your source of life, where we've embraced the things of this earth as our source of life, where we make friends with it, where we don't struggle anymore. We have embraced it, and it's, he calls that spiritual adultery. Basically saying, when you do that, this is my life, it's my money, it's my time, it's my career, and I'm going to do it my way, which is how I was raised, believing in the culture around me. And we encourage people by that. Be, be who, do what you want to do. Be who you want to be. It's your life. It's your money. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. But then we contrast that, James does, with the heart of those who love God and the bride of Christ who says, oh, oh, you're wrong. You're wrong. Here is the truth. It's not my life. It's not my money. It's not my time. It's not my career. It's not my way because here's why, for I am not my own. I have been bought with a price by the precious blood of Jesus who I serve. So I align my life and all of my resources under the authority of God. And that is what the spirit of the bride says. And we talked about in chapter 4. And then James says the same thing in chapter 5. And the word that James is really using, though it's never said, is stewardship. That's all he's been talking about, stewardship. And it's a word that we don't use very often. But what it is, is the closer that I walk with Jesus, the closer that I, I, I get to God and my heart falls in love with him more and more, and I, who, the God who I love with all my heart, who's changed me, transformed me, he's freed me, he has healed me, he has brought me into an intimacy with him. And I, as I follow him, that my, my life, my time, my money, and my talents are, are not given just, he, he's given them to me, not just for me to use as my right. It, it, was given, it was given to me to enjoy, but it was also given to me to be a steward of, to manage. And here is the joy, which is to take the resources, whatever they are, our time, our talent, our money, our abilities, whatever, the things that we have, and, and, and say, I, 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 I get to use them for the kingdom of God. People who understand that stewardship say things like this. I have not been put here to make a living. I have been put here to make a difference. Oh. I didn't even think of that. I've been put here to make a difference. And I haven't been just empowered by God to make a living. I, I've been empowered by God to make a living. And, and I'm thankful that I do have that. He has empowered me to make a living. But I've also been empowered by God to make a difference. Oh, my eyes start to open more. And my heart starts to open more to the ideas. And, and the greatest joy that I have is not that I'm just in relationship with God. Though I, I love that. But I'm, I'm also freed to release the things. Things that might show up then in eternity. And with this way of thinking, just this, this proactive approach to start to wonder about it, what if young people could start asking this question? Kids in high school, in junior high, we haven't been just put here to make a living. We have been put here to make a difference. We've been put here to make a difference in this world. And if we could hear that, and what if our kids had that perspective on life where you walk up and start to talk to the kids and the youth and start to say things, say, you may feel really insignificant at times in your life. But I want to tell you, the life of God is on you. Have a higher goal than just making a living. A much higher goal. God can empower you to make a difference. What if we could infuse that into the children's hearts and minds? I just think about it, and it just gets me excited. What if we have, what if we have used our resources, though? What if we've used them on ourselves? Well, first of all, you need to know there is so much grace over all of that. Or maybe we have been so invested down here that we don't even know how to untie ourselves from it. How many of you wish you could go back to your youth and just spin things differently? Oh, man. <laughs> and, I, I, and, I, and I'm talking far more than just money. Though I am talking about money, too. I'm talking about our time and our talent, where, where, you've spent, where you have spent the juice of your life. 
This is not a small issue in the kingdom of God. We are going to spend far more time in eternity than we do here, and we rarely think about that. I picture in my mind Abraham as seen in Genesis 24. What, what a picture he had, standing up straight, eyes and heart lifted to God, saying, God most high, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, everything I have belongs to you, everything I have came from you. And out of that, he gave to then God 10%. 10% just being a symbol of being a steward. That's where we came up with the idea of tithe. 10% was a symbol of the whole thing, everything you've given me. <laughs> this credit card from the government. <laughs> everything you've given me, God, I give you back 10%, and that's not meant to be a legalistic, well, I need to make sure it's down to the penny. It's it's a symbol of the whole. It's just like, God, you gave it all to me. I'm, I'm going to give you back. He knew it wasn't even his to claim. He's like, none of this. So then how do we start to develop and to walk consistently in the spirit of a steward? How do we break the power of mammon that already has some of us so bent over to the earth it feels like we're just shackled to it? And I can't even lift my shoulders straight anymore. Well, we're going to talk more about that. <laughs> But I want to wrap up with just a few thoughts of living as a steward that we're going to talk more about in a couple weeks. Because I think there are three things that are necessary to break the spirit of mammon and to be able to walk in the heart of a steward. First is we have to get a glimpse of God's glory. And that's one of the beautiful things we do on a Sunday. You can do it out, going on a walk in the forest. You can do it a million other ways. But I know that this is one of the ways that we do it is where we come together and we gather and we get a glimpse we just get a glimpse of the glory right here. Where we get a glimpse of eternity. I, I get it at church so often, and I know it's not the only place it has to happen or can happen, but it helps me to see what I really care about. Because I see the gold every single day. I see the gold, I see the gold, and it looks so shiny, and I want the gold too. What some of us desperately need to see is something brighter than the gold and I know what is brighter than the gold. It's, it's the one who shines, Jesus. It's where we get a glimpse of his glory. And another thing we need is a, a, we need to get a glimpse and a grip of the grace. People don't release the grip on mammon or release, uh, be released by mammon easily. But it's when people are amazed by grace it can happen. When the love of God is shared upon the hearts of people, one of the first things that happens throughout the Bible over and over and over you see again is that when they get a glimpse of God, when they grasp him, their hearts open up and they start to give. Another thing that breaks the power of mammon is simple acts of obedience and faith where we start to establish a pattern of breaking the power by doing things. And we'll talk more about that later. To even begin to start to stand up straight, we need we just need a glimpse of God's glory. So I'm going to close in prayer as we go back into worship. There's a song that I, I, I think of that I grew up hearing in church that we used to sing a lot. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Where we ask God, we ask for the ability to do that. To look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. God, we have found something brighter than the gold that is your glory. Sometimes it, it happens in worship. Sometimes it, it can happen even as we pray. And sometimes it happens when truth intersects but when you see something brighter than the gold and your spirit is renewed and you start to think, yes, this is what I care about most. Nothing has more power to break the grip of mammon than when we fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And then he went... And we see his unveiled face where there's no hiding, no pretending. And when we look up, we look up into the face of Jesus and we see the glory of the Lord. And when we see his glory, we are transformed. 
And if you want to stand up straight and walk in the spirit of a steward, if you want to break the grip of mammon, you start with this. You look up and start to notice the glory that is greater and brighter than gold. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim.